learning more begin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajahn Min Tra, Ajahn Min T. And thank you very much, Tai Tisa, for uh, inviting me, for having me today to share one or two ideas about extensive reading and extensive listening. Let me start by sharing with you the most important takeaway of today's session. Yeah, I'm going to read to you slowly today's takeaway. Extensive reading and extensive listening is good for your students. It's good for you too. If by the end of today's session, you are still not convinced that extensive reading and listening is good for you and your students, I have at least five people in the audience who will support me, who will say the same thing. And these are Professor Rob Waring from Japan, a key member of the Extensive Reading Foundation. We've got Paul Goldberg, the president of X Reading, and also uh, a key member of the Extensive Reading Foundation. And there are many other people in the audience who will say the same thing, that extensive reading and extensive listening is extremely good for your students and also for you teachers uh, of English, uh, whatever you are. Uh, essentially two things that I want to share with you. Number one is what is the theory? What is the research out there uh, that have you know, extensively discussed uh, extensive reading and extensive listening? In other words, I'll be focusing on the what and the why of extensive reading. And then secondly, I will move on and talk about some potential applications, some implementations of extensive reading in the classroom. Uh, Yvonne later will share with you some thoughts about how you can get started, how you can implement extensive reading and listening uh, in your institutions. And then question and answer. Okay, let's get started with the theory and the research of extensive reading and extensive listening. When I say theory and research, we're not talking about some abstract things about extensive reading and extensive uh, listening, but something that you can relate to. Something that is, uh, you know, really, really not very difficult uh, to understand. Let me start off by uh, sharing with you my thoughts about what extensive reading and listening is all about. Very briefly, this is what extensive reading and extensive listening is all about. It's reading and listening for pleasure, it's reading and listening for recreation. Something that is enjoyable to do. One very, very important thing about extensive reading and extensive listening is this notion uh, of pleasure. Something that is fun to do, something that you do because you want to, not something that you do because you have to. So something which is pleasurable and uh, enjoyable to do. Now, when you do extensive reading and listening, you also are not looking at very minute details of the information presented in the listening materials or in the reading materials. You listen for enjoyment, for general information. If you know the beginning, the middle, and the end of the story, for example, then that's, that's, that's about you know, all that you want to uh, you know, to find out from the listening and from the re reading that you do. You don't necessarily want to remember every single detail about the year that the main character was born, for example, and the uh, you know, specific details that happen in the story. So it's reading or listening for general uh, information, in particular information that you really, really want to know. And finally, this is a little bit tricky. Let me explain to you very carefully. Yeah, it's not the kind of reading and listening for study purposes for examinations, for example, yeah? Not for uh, you or for your students to respond to detail listening comprehension or reading comprehension uh, questions. It's not for that kind of purpose, although it might help, you know, at the end of the reading, you may be able to answer those questions, but that is not the main purpose. So again, extensive reading and extensive listening is uh, you know, listening and reading for pleasure, reading and listening for recreational purposes, reading and listening for general information, and reading and listening possible. The kind of reading and listening that, you know, the moment you start, you want to continue doing it until you get to the end, because the content is so interesting, the content is so exciting uh, for you. 
Point number two, which is extremely important for language learning purposes is this, the language of the listening materials, of the reading materials will have to be accessible. It has to be at the student's level, slightly above is okay, slightly below is also okay. The most important thing is that the students are able to get the overall gist of the uh, listening and the reading uh, materials. So I would use the word accessible language. For some students, it may be easy language, but for some students, it may be a little bit more challenging. That should be uh, okay, as far as extensive reading and listening is concerned. The next point to remember is that if you are looking for the optimal effect of extensive reading and listening, then the amount, the quantity of listening and reading will have to be massive. The students will need to do it over a period of time. The students will need to do it on a regular basis, on a daily basis, maybe about 15 or 20 minutes a day over a period of time. And finally, another important dimension is this. There has to be uh, you know, a wide range of materials that are available for the students to choose from. So the key thing to remember here is choice, yeah? So the uh, type of reading or the type, uh, the kind of reading that students do is not always dictated by the teacher, but it is something that the students can choose, you know, the kind of books, the kind of listening materials that they want to, uh, to read. And because of that, because students have a wide range of interests, we need to make sure that we have, you know, available a range of uh, materials for the students. Okay, so this is more or less what extensive reading and extensive listening is all about. Now, here is a little bit of the theory that we have, you know, we, we should be able to glean from research, from the years of research in the nature of language acquisition. Point number one, we can acquire language from reading. Yeah, point number two, we can acquire language from listening. But more importantly, we can learn more if we do both, if we do both reading and listening. I think the, uh, the uh, amount of language development that you can expect to happen in your students uh, increases a great deal if you do both reading and listening, or if you get your students to do uh, both reading and listening over a longer period of time. But what do we learn from reading and listening uh, actually? A lot. Let me share with you some of the uh, benefits that have been reported uh, for, you know, in the literature and also based on my own observation and my own experience of doing extensive reading and listening. There's this linguistic benefit, the language benefit. In other words, uh, students who read a great deal, students who listen a great deal are likely to have a larger vocabulary size. Not only the number of words that they have increased, but also the depth of knowledge about these words also increase a great deal. In other words, it's not just a matter of knowing 1,000 words or 2,000 words, but the students are able to know these words and also to be able to use these words for maybe for speaking, for listening, and other language uh, learning purposes. Now, on top of that, research also tells us that the student's knowledge of the grammar of the language also increases a great deal the ability, their knowledge about the uh, different types of text structure also increases a great deal. In other words, there's a lot of linguistic benefits associated with extensive reading and extensive listening. Yeah. What about the cognitive benefit? Again, the cognitive benefit is also uh, quite substantial. Now, students who read or listen a great deal uh, are likely to have a wider you know, knowledge of the world, basically. They know a lot more about different countries, for example. They'll know a lot more about sports. They know a lot more about different types of food in different places. In other words, their world knowledge also increases. And we know in, in, in any kind of learning, including language learning, knowledge is a key variable for comprehension. Knowledge is an important variable uh, where learning is concerned. On top of that, the student's ability to make inferences, the student's ability to summarize, to synthesize information also uh, increases if they do a lot of reading and listening over a period of time. And finally, from the uh, motivational aspect, the effective aspect, 
you know, uh, it's been also reported that students' motivation tends to increase and their enjoyment uh, for learning English in and out of the classroom also increases a great deal. Uh, let me share with you a very interesting quote from this lady. She's a novelist, her name is Lisa Lee, and she has published a lot of novels, fiction. And this is what she says about the benefit of reading. Let me read this to you. Read a thousand books and your words will flow like a river. Yeah, it's a very casual observation, but I think it means a lot to you know, teachers who have been trying very hard to get their students to be able to speak the language. This is one quote that will help you understand the importance of reading uh, a great deal. Words flowing like a river means when you speak, it becomes so easy for you to produce the language. It, it's easier for you to express yourself in speaking and also in writing. In other words, this is the benefit. Yeah, if you since read a great deal, they'll become fluent readers and they'll become fluent listeners. But what is the big deal about being fluent readers and fluent listeners? How are they related to speaking and to writing? Because eventually, eventually uh, we want our students to be able to express themselves in speaking and also in writing. Now, here is the uh, link between reading and listening and speaking and writing. Again, this is something that I have uh, experienced myself. This is something that I've seen happening and reported by uh, experts in ELT and in TESOL. This is what happens. Now, fluent readers are likely to become good writers. Yeah. In other words, reading can be seen as a, as a stepping stone, as a springboard to students developing their writing skills. What about listening? Again, listening can also lead to students becoming better speakers. So the relationship is there for you to, to see. Now, if they do both, chances are they will eventually become fluent users of the language. Let me just share with you some uh, questions that I have heard from, uh, from people. Uh, from teachers who ask me questions like, well, my students have been doing a lot of reading, but their speaking skill you know, has not improved a great deal. My advice to them is, well, in addition to reading, your students should also be doing a lot of listening because of this relationship between reading and writing and listening and speaking. Today, uh, you know, if, if you can get the students to do reading and listening at the same time, simultaneous reading and listening, I think chances are they'll be able to develop uh, both reading skills and listening skills, which eventually uh, help them uh, develop uh, their writing and speaking skills as well. Okay, if you're looking for a, uh, a uh, support from experts in the field, now here is one. Stephen Krashen uh, said this many years ago. Uh, looking at the you know, relationship between reading and writing, which I think is a very nice observation that he did many years ago. When enough reading is done, all the necessary grammatical features and discourse rules for writing will automatically be presented to the writer in sufficient quantity. Essentially, what he's saying is that if you do a lot of reading, chances are you will become a good writer one day. Uh, in the same way, uh, this guy, echoing Stephen Krashen, Ajahn Willy says this. I'm just rephrasing uh, what Krashen said and replacing reading with listening. When enough listening is done, all the necessary grammatical structures and discourse rules for speaking will also be automatically be presented to the speaker in sufficient quantity. Now, I hope you can see here the link between uh, reading and writing and listening and speaking. Very briefly now, let me just try to explain to you in a very simple way how language acquisition happens from the initial uh, stage of students receiving language input through listening and speaking uh, all the way through 
uh, them being able to produce language for mostly from speaking and for writing uh, purposes, yeah? Okay, the starting point is this. In order for students to acquire any language, they need to receive a lot of oral and written input from various sources. So input is a prerequisite. In our discussion today, input comes from listening and comes from reading as well. But this input, this listening and reading materials will have to be comprehensible. It has to be engaging. It has to be rich as well, providing students with a variety of uh, language structures and also language features. That's the process, yeah? It has to be comprehensible. It has to be interesting. It has to be, uh, you know, uh, it has to show a lot of instances of how language is used for different uh, communicative situations. And then acquisition actually happens when all this, the uh, comprehensible and engaging input and rich input is available in sufficient quantity and also in sufficient frequency. That's how acquisition happens. And eventually, uh, students will be able to begin to use the language for production, for speaking, and for writing uh, purposes. Pay attention to what acquisition means here. What does it look like when we say that students have acquired the language, have, you know, assimilated, have consolidated a lot of linguistic information in their head? What does it mean, actually? Here, people have tried to describe what this linguistic system that we have in our head that allows us to produce language. Now, here is one description uh, from uh, Van Patten. This complex and implicit system is not dependent on learner practice of language. Yeah, so this system that we have in our head that allows us, that enables us to use language is not dependent on learner practice. Practice here is like exercises or speaking practice or writing practice, but rather it's dependent on exposure to what is called input. Yeah, input in our discussion today is extensive reading and extensive uh, listening in particular. Let me take you to another quote so that you can see the link here between extensive reading, extensive listening, and this acquisition thing that we discussed, which is complex and implicit in nature, with this quote. I think this quote makes a lot of sense to me, and hopefully it makes a lot of sense to you. It's taken from a book, a second language acquisition book, written by Sean uh, Lowen, 2015. This is what he said. A very nice quote that I remember very, very well. Yeah, I'm going to read this to you, for you. The ability to produce language relatively easily for communicative purposes draws heavily on implicit language knowledge. Let me read this again. And I want you to remember this because this is something that is you know, relatively easy to understand, but when it comes to application, you know, teachers find this to be not very, very straightforward. And I hope you can see the link here between this quote and our discussion today about extensive reading and listening. The ability to produce, which is the final goal of our teaching, is helping our students to be able to produce language for communicative purposes. But this ability depends or draws heavily on implicit knowledge. And this is where extensive reading and extensive re listening comes in. Because reading in quantity, listening in quantity will help students develop this implicit and also complex knowledge of the language. Let me give you some examples. Yeah. Again, this one is reported in the literature some years back. Uh, a researcher who was interested in finding out what some of the most successful English language learners in China went through in order to develop 
a high level of proficiency in the language. Now, we are not talking about just any language learners in China, but these are learners who are extremely successful, who took part in national speak English speaking competitions and who probably won first place or second place. Yeah. So again, these are very bright, very successful uh, users of the English language. What they said was interesting. They spent many hours practicing. Remember practice here. For many people, what practice means grammar practice. For many people, practice here means, you know, vocabulary practice, memorizing words, or maybe speaking practice, but that is not the case. What this, what this students did actually, they spend a lot of time doing a lot of listening. They're doing a lot of repeated listening. They listen to the same materials again and again and again for days and for weeks. Look at this. Let me read this to you yeah, slowly. This girl said, one of the most successful uh, users of English in China, I was slow in the beginning and I had to listen to it many more times. Quite normal, yeah? And gradually I developed some feel for the language. The technical term for this that researchers, people like Rob Waring and me use is implicit knowledge of the language. So people on the street, you know, girls, students will refer to this as feel. They have developed this intuition, the language intuition or the feel for the language. They can tell you whether something is right or something is not right because of this feel that they have developed over a period of time. There's another one here that is very interesting. I feel that after listening many, many times, I just have countless number of patterns sort of swimming around in my head. Again, what are these patterns? Now, these are language forms. These are grammatical features. These are sentence pa patterns. These are phrases and things like that. They just stick in their head and they begin to sort of, you know, wait for the, uh, for the uh, user to make use of this in speaking or in writing. Lines from movies often naturally pop up. And the question for us is this, what does patterns mean? Does it refer to vocabulary? Does it refer to grammar or does it refer to both? Uh, Rob Waring, a question for you, vocabulary, grammar or both? Please say both. Otherwise I'm going to be stuck in here. Rob, say both. Yes, both. Very good. <laughs> both is both vocabulary and grammar. Now in the literature, you know, the technical words for this is the lexical chunks, lexical bundles and things like that of fixed expressions. Yeah. So that is what uh, these girls refer to as patterns. Now these patterns are part of their implicit linguistic knowledge, part of the acquired uh, system. Now here are some examples. Yeah, so very quickly here, some examples for you to look at. Now these are expressions that people use just like that because they are already, uh, you know, they're already there in your head and it's very easy for you to use this together uh, as a group, as a chunk like this, yeah? More examples, more examples, there you go. Uh, this one is on me, it was lovely to see you, thanks for coming, let me think about it, just looking, thanks, I'll be with you in a minute and so on and so forth. Now let's pause a minute here. Again, research tells us very clearly that competent speakers, competent users of the language, people like Ajahn Kenny, the president of Thai TESOL, uh, people like Ajahn Minty uh, from Chulalongkorn University. Now, they, they are very competent users of the language. Now, if you look at their head, what is inside their head is, you know, all these patterns, all these grammatical expressions that they have in great quantity, thousands, hundreds of thousands probably. These are the kind of grammatical patterns that you can you know, use very quickly, very easily without you having to spend a lot of time thinking about this. In other words, this is very, these are very, very important uh, you know, foundation, if you like, for your students to be able to speak the language with ease and with accuracy. If you're looking for some you know, empirical evidence, let me share with you two. I haven't seen anything on reading yet, but I've seen two 
uh, meta-analysis studies on extensive reading. Uh, both studies were published in high-profile journals in our field. The first one was published in TESOL quarterly some years back, and then almost uh, you know, on the same year or the year after, uh, another uh, meta-analysis study was also published in another high-profile journal, reading in a foreign language. Yeah. Well, essentially what it means, what, what, what the study, uh, what the two studies showed is that the effect size of extensive reading on students' language development is quite substantial. So in terms of effect size is 0.5, you know, uh, moderately large effect size. Uh, on top of that, if you add your own personal experiences, observations that you do with the top students that you have in your class, then I think you can build a very convincing case that extensive reading and extensive listening are actually very, very important to help your students develop their English language proficiency. Uh, let me share with you some uh, case studies, if you like. Uh, some have been reported in the literature and some just from my acquaintances with the uh, uh, people that I've met in my life as a language teacher. Uh, the first one here is a lady, a teenager from Korea. Uh, she must have read about 1,000 books. Remember Lisa Lee that I mentioned to you early on? Read 1,000 books and your words will flow like a river. This girl did exactly that. She did read, she did read more than 1,000 books and she became you know, very, very competent, very proficient in the English language. Well, actually, actually, the researcher who interviewed the girl and the mother had a very interesting story to say, to tell, to tell us. When the researcher interviewed the mother, the mother actually said, no, 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 not 1,000 words, not 1,000 books. Actually, the girl read 4,000 books. Wow, that's like four times as many. I don't know who you are to believe, is the girl or the mother? You know, mothers usually tend to say things they don't mean to say, but they're nice people. They tend to exaggerate a little bit, yeah? Uh, here is another one from Thailand. Uh, this girl was just wonderful. Uh, I can't remember the name of the girl. Uh, she is still pretty young and she, her English was just wonderful. And what, when I speak to her, when I spoke to her, uh, she said that she used to watch a lot of Disney cartoons. And that's why her speaking ability was just uh, very, very good. Another example here from, from Vietnam. Also very good. Uh, his IELTS uh, speaking score was eight, I think. Uh, his reading was seven and a half. Overall, uh, his average IELTS score was seven and a half. And then uh, teachers as well. Remember what I said earlier on, that reading, extensive reading and listening is good for students and also for teachers. This teacher, uh, she said to me that she watched a lot of movies and her English is also very, very lovely. And the last person, the next speaker for today also used to watch a lot of TV uh, series. Her favorite was this one, Laura Ingalls. I don't know if you remember Laura Ingalls, The Little House on the Prairie. Uh, she will tell you more about this later, yeah? but she speaks beautiful English actually. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope at this point you have become a little bit convinced that extensive reading and extensive listening are extremely useful for language learning uh, purposes. Let me share with you now my thoughts about potential classroom applications. Here is point number one. When you try to sort of implement extensive reading or extensive reading in a smaller way, this is what you need to do. In your typical reading or listening lesson, make sure that the students have a lot more time actually doing the uh, reading and the listening in the classroom. You can do some other things like warming up activities, doing some predicting activities, that's fine, yeah? But I think, I think we need to reduce the amount of activities that take up too much classroom time, that takes time away from the students doing the actual reading 
and listening in the classroom. I think this is very, very important. In a typical reading lesson, in a typical listening lesson, the students listen and read very minimally. And remember the amount of listening and the amount of reading is what contributes, you know, substantially to uh, students' language development, not the many activities that you do. Although the activities may be exciting and interesting, but unless students are actually engaged in doing the reading and doing the listening, I don't think we can expect our students to uh, develop their proficiency uh, very much. Application number two. In terms of the uh, reading and the listening materials, I would strongly suggest that we use easier and more enjoyable, more interesting reading and listening materials. The kind of materials that get students to think a little bit more, the kind of listening and, and reading materials that spark their interest, their curiosity and their imagination. I think these are materials that are likely to capture uh, students' attention and also uh, their interest in doing the listening and reading. Also think about tasks that promote more listening and more reading both in and out of the classroom. I think that's very important as well. When you teach reading, the students should be doing a lot of reading in the classroom and hopefully also outside the classroom. Try to build a link, try to make the students curious about what is the follow-up of, of the reading passage that they have just done in the classroom. We should not use a reading materials that is complete, that is so comprehensive that the students don't want to or don't need to find out anything else about the uh, information that has been uh, presented in the lesson. Yeah. So try to build that link so that the students become interested in exploring further a similar type of information that is probably available on the internet. Teachers, if you have been a teacher, my advice to you, uh, I hope my friends here, Rob Waring, will also say the same thing. Teach less, not more. I think we all teachers, we mean well. Yes, when we teach more, we hope that the students will learn more. That doesn't always happen, unfortunately, especially in, uh, you know, uh, in, in the language classroom. My suggestion is for us to teach less explicit grammar. If you have been teaching, for example, like 50 grammatical points over a semester or over a one year period, reduce it by half. So that would be my advice to you. The reason being, you know, students won't remember, number one, those grammatical points. And number two, these grammatical points are not very useful, I would say. Remember what I said early on, the quotation that I shared with you, because the ability to use language easily for communicative purposes depends on implicit knowledge of the language, not on explicit knowledge of the grammar of the language. Some explicit grammar teaching can be useful, but too much is not particularly useful. Point number two, uh, less explicit teaching of comprehension skills, like predicting, guessing meanings from context and things like that. Yeah. I think if the students have been doing a lot of reading on their own, doing a lot of listening on their own, now these skills will have automatically been acquired by the students. How about critical thinking skills? I think that one uh, is something that we need to give a bit more attention to, but after the students have reached a certain level of proficiency in the language. But things like predicting, guessing meanings from context, skimming, for example, scanning and things like that. Now, these are things that the students are able to do. They can do it already when the language is accessible, when they do it in their first language. But they can't skim, or they can actually, or they can scan in the second language, but after they have done that, they still will tell you that teachers, I've skimmed and I've scanned and I still don't understand. I've tried to guess the meaning of the difficult words, I still don't understand. Yeah. So the, uh, the, uh, the question is not that the students lack these skills, 
But the question is whether they have sufficient language to make use of these skills that they have probably acquired in their first language. And point number, the last one is less test taking skills. I know that a lot of people, a lot of teachers are, you know, they do care about the student's performance on the final, you know, big examinations, but the research again shows that students who read a great deal, students who listen a great deal, I don't think they need a lot of test taking skills in order to do well on the big uh, examinations. And let the students learn more. And what do I mean by that? Here are some examples. Make sure that the students do a lot of repeated list reading and repeated listening in the classroom. Yeah. Uh, provide opportunities for the students to listen five times maybe of a reading passage that you use in the classroom. Ask students to do shadow reading or shadow listening. This is a lot of fun to do and this allows students to rehearse, to hear again, to listen again, and also to practice speaking at the same time. Shadow reading and shadow uh, listening. Doing this is also a good thing, reading while listening. If you don't know it already, there is now a uh, digital library that has a lot of uh, graded reading materials, which allows students to read and also to listen at the same time. And the name of that program is X Reading. It's a wonderful, wonderful digital library for you know, graded readers that the students can be encouraged to do reading while uh, listening. Next one. Again, this comes from uh, you know, my years and years of observation and conversations with a lot of teachers. You know, they will tell you, yes, reading is good, but my students are not interested. My students are not motivated in reading. When they do say that I will you know, turn the table around and ask, and ask them, are you a reader yourself? Can you become a model of a passionate reader? I think the key thing to motivate our students is for us to become a reader ourselves. number one, and number two, for us to show enthusiasm and to show our passion about reading. And this thing is very, very uh, infectious. So my advice again, when you walk into the classroom, always bring a book that you are reading at the moment and tell them how exciting the book is and how excited you are in reading the book and maybe share one or two lines from the book to uh, your students. And chances are the next day or the week after the students will come back to you and say, teacher, teacher, I just bought that book and I'm reading that book myself now. So, if you hear people say that, you know, my students are not motivated, I think one response is this, there's no such things as students who don't like to read. What happens is that they just have not found the books that they want to read. And that happens everywhere. Let me, let me share with you a real story. This boy, he is old, much older now. Now this boy used to live in the same house with me, my son. When it comes to reading, he would just find excuses. You know, he didn't want to read. He, he, you know, reading is a waste of time, he thought. Until one day, his teacher brought a book or mentioned a book in his classroom. Now, these are the books. And the teacher allowed him to borrow one book. This is the author of that book. And surprise, surprise, the next day he started reading this book. And one week later, he asked me to buy all the books written by the same guy. That is how he got started. And that is, that is how he got hooked onto reading. All 50 titles by the same author. Yeah, the only downside is that the dad, the daddy had to spend a lot of money, you know, buying these books for him, yeah. So before you say that your students don't want to read, they're not interested, they're not excited about reading, do this. Find out, ask your students what books they want to read. Now, a colleague of mine in Singapore did just that. Uh, in one of her studies, she asked about 2,000 
students in Singapore, all teenagers, about the books that they wanted to read. And these are five of the top uh, picks among teenagers in Singapore. Percy Jackson, Hunger Games, Harry Potters, and things like that. And guess what? Do you think school libraries have the collections of these books? Only some. The majority don't have this you know, kind of books that the students really, really want to read. Reasons being, mm, these are just you know, fluffy books. They are not serious books. They are not literature. You know, they are not literature books and things like that. But these are the kind of books that students actually want to read. OK. Yes, really, really, yes, what you've been saying is all true, but, you know, teachers still find it difficult. Yes, but it's not easy to implement uh, extensive reading or extensive listening. Some of, some of you may be saying things like, okay, we've got no books. True, but not true as well. Yeah, materials are nowadays easily available on the internet. Or if your schools have money, you can subscribe to X Reading because X Reading is one complete package that will allow your students to have access to a huge number of books, uh, all available 24 hours a day. Uh, number two is no time. Again, time is a big issue. Uh, if you can try to negotiate with the uh, important people in your school, tell them that, well, after listening from Willie's presentation and other people's presentation about extensive reading and extensive learning, I think we need now to reduce the amount of content in the curriculum. I think we're teaching too much content. In our case, content here refers to maybe vocabulary and grammar. And another point is, does it really work? The answer is yes, it does. I think this is something that will take quite a while for you to become convinced that extensive reading and listening actually work and it works very, very well. It just needs a little bit of time, a little bit of patience, give yourself one year and you will see, you know, wonderful, wonderful results in your students. If you want to read or find out more about reasons why students are not, or teachers are not implementing extensive reading, now here's a free book for you. I'll show you the link later, yeah? Uh, top 10 implementation issues of uh, extensive reading. If you want to find out more about how you can implement extensive reading in Thailand, please come to the uh, Thai TESOL session next month, July 10th. The three beautiful ladies there will be sharing with you how extensive reading Online extensive reading can be implemented wonderfully in, uh, in universities in Thailand. And there's the guy there, Paul Goldberg, will also be sharing with you how extensive reading can be you know, an important uh, resource for your school and for your students uh, to develop their English language proficiency. Ladies and gentlemen, I've shared with you two major points, basically, the what and the why of extensive reading and listening. I hope you are convinced. If you're not convinced, please ask questions and I'll get Rob Waring to answer your questions and also Francisca Maria to answer your questions. And I've also shared with you some applications yeah, in the classroom. And finally, uh, if you want to have a copy of my slides, please scan the QR code on the left-hand side. And if you want to have free books, like the two examples there on the screen, primacy of extensive reading and listening, the power of serious books. Now, these are very, very good, uh, you know, book chapters written by me and uh, a couple of other colleagues, including uh, Richard Day, the father of extensive reading, and also Stephen Krashen on the right-hand side, the power of serious reading. And the uh, website address is my name, willyrenandia.com. Ladies and 